why is giving charity so 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 challenging? Why is lending money so challenging? You know, you, we have today, you know, f- you have a Fidelity account, which is you put money in that account, it's immediately recognized by the R- IRS that that money is arm's length from you and that money is designated for charity. You can't use that money only for charity. So therefore, when you want to give charity, what your approach to give charity, that money is not available to you. Because once you put it in that account, you have no control over that money. That money basically has been given away. Now it's just a question where you designate it. Charity A, B, Z, wherever it may go. It's a terrific thing. Why? Because the main challenge when it comes to giving away something, you have many reasons why you want to hold on to it. You may have an investment that you want to make. You may want to buy something extra. And if you give it away, you're not able to buy whatever you want to buy. As a result of that, the many questions you have in your mind that I don't want to, as they say, you don't want to shoot yourself in your leg, in your foot. Because by giving it away, you're actually, this moment, you're weakening your base. But let's say you put money initially, you make money, you have a profit, you give some percentage, you put it in the Fidelity account. Or the Jewish fund, which is a communal charity fund. And it's up to you to make a recommendation where it should go. Makes it very easy. Because now the challenge of that money I may need, it's a rubble when you may need it. That money's not available to you any longer. So it's a tremendous gift, this concept, to lock the money away. Once you put in that account, basically, for all intents, it's given away. Now you are only the one to designate and direct where that money should go. That's the value of all these accounts. Not only does it make it easier, bookkeeping-wise, government-wise, because immediately they send the statement of what was given to charity, but even in terms of fighting with your own demons, it has phenomenal value. I mean, I myself, I put a certain amount of money in a Fidelity account, easy. And I recommend as you go here or there. Otherwise, you always have questions. Everybody has questions. But the Chavetz Chaim preceded the Fidelity account by, he wrote this 125 years ago. He set up a free loan fund. You make a, a certain amount of money profit. You take a percentage of that profit, you put it in that free loan fund. The moment you put it in that fund, you no longer have questions. That money now is available to lend people money. And it circulates within that context of lending money. And you don't take money out of that fund once you put it into that fund. So what have you done? You've preempted the evil inclination to try to convince you or other people to convince you why you shouldn't do it and why it may be irresponsible. Because once you did it, it's in there, it's it's not available to you any longer. The Chavetz Chaim already recommended this going 125 years ago. Because every one of us is susceptible. We all have the same whispering in our ears. You now they speak about, you know, we have ringing in your ears. So it's a condition. Everybody has the condition. It's called whispering in your ears. And we try to shut out those whisperings by preempting the evil inclination. That's what it's all about. To set aside money, you make a certain profit, percentage automatically goes into that. It's interesting. You know, the Lahabdil, El Habdolas, the Mormons. You know, every Mormon, when they finish school, they give two years of service to what they believe in. And they go around for two years missionizing. And they wear a certain type of dress, which is almost a uniform. And they go from door to door, knocking on doors, asking people if they're interested in hearing about what they have to offer. And they have all kinds of printed material. And they'll come down and speak to you. And they do, they're missionizing, they're missionaries. Every person does it. You could be a professional football player. You take two years off to do your service. 
the moment they tithe their earnings, every moment tithes is their earnings. And if you identify with whatever that is, you tithe the earnings. So it's it's ready, it's like built into the system. It's like you pay your taxes, you pay your tax to the Mormon church. That's what you do. And once it's there, it's it's not accessible. And you do it because every Mormon does it. When people don't do it, it makes it more difficult. But if everybody does it, it's understood. When you make a certain amount of money, a certain percentage is tithed, you tithe your earnings. That's the way it goes. We have to tithe. The, it, the concept of tithing is already a Torah concept. Except the Torah concept is on grain, produce that grows in Israel. Tithing of earnings, it's a question. Rabbinical, it's a custom. But whatever it is, it's something which is very profound and very effective and makes life a lot, a lot less complicated. Now, when you lend money, you can lend small sums of money to different people, or you can lend a large amount to one person who's credible, who has a good guarantor, gives you good collateral, and you don't have to deal with it. You, you lend small amounts of money, what are you doing? You have to be busy with multiple people, lending and collecting debts, taking small amounts of collateral. It's a headache. It's much easier. Give a larger amount of money as a loan, and you, whatever the due date is due, you'll deal with it. So the Chavetz Chaim says it's not it's not the way to do it. Why? Because the law of charity, there's priorities in charity. If you have a poor man and you have a rich man, who do you lend first? Who has priority on that loan? And you only have enough money to lend only the poor man, not the rich man. It's, the poor man takes pr pr prior precedence over the rich man. Because the poor man is in need. The rich man, he even though he's in need, but his need is a different kind of need. Because the rich man could put his hand in his pocket and he could actually shift it from one location to another and have what he needs. The poor man has no way to turn. Therefore, the poor man has, has priority on the money. When you lend a large amount of money to one person, it's usually to a rich person. You lend small amounts, that's the poor people. So qualitatively speaking, it's a greater mitzvah to give multiple small loans because the, the recipients of those loans, they, they're more qualified than giving the loan to a person who's classified differently financially. Therefore, you should give small amounts rather than, multi, than large amounts. That's first. Secondly, every time you lend money, it's a separate positive commandment. So if you small, lend small amounts to multiple people, you're doing multiple positive commandments. You lend a large amount to one person, it's only one positive commandment. So if you have an ability to do multiple positive commandments, one, which one, which one is the first choice? You do multiple. Therefore, it's encouraged to lend small amounts of money to multiple people rather than one large amount to one person. That's the way it should be done. When we speak about doing a mitzvah, it's not just you get credit for it, as we just said. It's not that you just get credit for it. Every time you do a mitzvah, the Torah tells us, we say in the third paragraph of the Shema, that when we do a mitzvah, and we, the blessing we say on a mitzvah is, Asher Kiddushanu b'mitzvah sal b'tzvah, Asher Kiddushanu, was sanctified. Every time you do a mitzvah, it has an effect on you. As much as we don't realize it, we are some degree touched by it. So if you do the larger the larger amount of money, how how often are you touched by the mitzvah? Once. You do multiple mitzvahs, the same mitzvah. That means you're sanctified and sanctified and sanctified. So you become a different person. It's not only you the reward in the world to come 
is greater. But factually, the experience of being touched multiple times by the mitzvah, you, you become immediately the beneficiary of the action of lending the money. You know, there's a question which is asked. Whenever we do a positive command, we say a blessing. But yet when we give charity, we don't say a blessing. Why not? This question is asked by the early commentators. It's a positive commandment, and it's an important positive commandment. Eat matzah, we say a blessing on the matzah. Take the four species of the lulav, we say a blessing. It's predicated on a blessing. Why don't we say a blessing on charity? So one of the early, early commentators' answers, what happens if you give somebody charity, and the man says, I'm not satisfied with what you give me, gives you the money back. This comes out. Retroactively, it's a blessing in vain. So there's always a chance when you give charity, the poor man may not take it from you. He says, you, you need the amount you give me, you need it more than I need it. So whatever you de- so therefore it's not always definite that you're doing a mitzvah, because the mitzvah is only if the person receives it and accepts it. If he rejects it, you have none of the mitzvah. As a result of that, one doesn't say the blessing, because it may turn out to be a blessing in vain, if in fact the poor man is not agreeable to take the money. That's why you don't say the blessing before giving stalker. So what about a situation where you know he will take it? He will take it. The answer is when they legislated blessings, it's on the context on what the way this normally presents itself. Since within charity, there are times where the poor man will not take it, because he's not satisfied with the amount you're giving him, or a person wants to borrow something, and he's not satisfied. You say, a person comes for a $1,000 loan or 10000 say, I'll give you a 1000 He says, no, it's not worth my while. Not worth my while. And he'll give it back to you. You know, so since all this area, it's subject to every person, and not always will you do it, so they never legislated the, the blessing to be applied in these in these areas, a positive commandment. That's, that's the answer that's given. I told the story not long ago on this, on regarding this, and it happened maybe a year or two ago. This person came from Israel to raise money to marry off a child. And he comes into this wealthy man's house and he gives him a check for $25. And the rich man sees the man is, is, is disappointed. And before he gave him $25 check, he asked him how many children do you have? How many children are married off? And this was the first child he was marrying off and he had 10 children. So he gave him $25 and he says, he sees the man's disappointed. So he says to the person, I see you disappointed. I gave, he said, but I'll tell you why. Because I know next year you're coming back for another check. So if I give you a large check now, you expect a large check next year. So you're coming back. So therefore I figure I'll give you a smaller check. So therefore next year I'll give you another check. Because you're going to be coming back multiple times in the future. And the person who came, he was a person who was proud. Proud, I don't mean in a negative way. He was not a beggar. He had no choice. He had to come. He needed help to marry off his child. So he said to this person with all sincerity, he says, you know something? The reason why you give me less is because you don't want me to come back next year to ask you again. He says, let me ask you a question. Who said you'll be here next year? That you leave me able to have the opportunity to give me another check. Maybe next year you're not going to be here. Maybe next year you're not going to be alive any longer. Now you have a chance to do the mitzvah. Next year you may not be able to do the mitzvah. When he said this to this person, he was like really shaken. You know, people believe you have the money in your pocket. The other man's at your mercy, so to say, or is that your beck and call? You have a right to dictate. You're coming back next year. You come back in three years. Who said three years are going to be here? And it's the truth. Nobody knows what, what next year is going to bring. So he asked him for the check back and he wrote him a check for $5,000. Because really, it was a rude awakening realizing that we're, we're not what we think we are. We're not as secure. You know, we're saving for a rainy day. Who said you'll be there when that rainy day happens? First of all, who said there'll be a rainy day? And if, if there is a rainy day, who said you'll be there for that rainy day? 
as a result of that, one should not, of course, one has to act responsibly. But responsible doesn't mean not to give. You should give something which at least will make a difference. But to give something which does make a difference and you're just embarrassing the person, then you know something? It's better maybe not to give rather than embarrass the person. It tells us there's a verse in um, Tilim where David Mel says, Sosa nochi amrsecho kemotze sholorov. I rejoice over your mitzvot as if I've come upon great spoils. Person goes to battle and he comes back with great spoils. He has tremendous joy. So David Mel says, I rejoice over your, mitz- your mitzvot as if I came upon large spoils. Returning from war with victory. So the Gemara says, when did David say this? David was in a bathhouse and he realized he's detached from mitzvahs. And a bathhouse person is not permitted to study Torah because it's unclean. Totally detached. We know how important environment is. When your environment, which is conducive to spirituality, it's something very valuable. When you're in the bathhouse, what are you? You cut off from any spiritual level of influence when you're in the bathhouse. Then David, what he realized, he looked at his circumcision and he sees he's circumcised. Now, what does the circumcision re- represent? It's known as the sign of the covenant. It's we say, and we say the grace after the meal, the benching, the birch zamozon, we say, Abrisko Shech Samtivisarenu, the covenant which is engraved, engraved in our flesh. So even when you're in the bathhouse, you're naked, you're totally devoid of any mitzvah, but still that's with you. So when he saw his circumcision, he immediately says, I rejoice over your mitzvahs as if I come upon great spoils. So this question is asked, David, even though he's in the bathhouse, he has a mezuzah on his doorpost at home. Every minute you have a mezuzah on your doorpost, every second it's there, it's a fulfillment of a positive commandment. It's ongoing. Ongoing, the mitzvah, it just keeps generating positive commandments. It's like when a person wears a four-cornered garment. Every moment you wear the tzitzis, if they're, if they're kosher, if they were attached correctly, Every moment, every second, every nanosecond, you fulfill a positive commandment. It's a continuous infusion. So even if you're in the bathhouse, you have the mezuzah on your doorpost. The mezuzah on your doorpost, every second that it's on your doorpost, you're filling a positive commandment. So it was David. What if David feel bereft that in the bathhouse, he's detached from the mitzvah? So the answer which is given is, we're not talking about the fulfillment of the mitzvah. It's speaking about the actual involvement in mitzvah. Being involved actually sanctifies you. Because you, in the action, you're using, you're involved, your physicality is engaged in the mitzvah itself. David was not engaged. Maybe on his doorpost. But where is he? He's in the bathhouse. Credit-wise, he's accredited for the mitzvah. But he personally is not involved in doing the mitzvah itself. So the Chavetz Chaim writes, you know, a person's at work. He's a business. And he has a free loan. And he has somebody administering what he's not able to administer himself. He has somebody else administering for him. But factually, the money that's in that free loan is his money. So when somebody acts on his own behalf, on his behalf, and he vets the people, that they're qualified borrowers, and he gives them the money, even though he's doing something else, whether he's studying Torah, he's in the office, that fund is continuously generating mitzvahs for him. So he's continuously being accredited for doing something special. But if you're the one who has to give the money, always because you have the money in your pocket and you have to meet with the person. Do I take the money out of my pocket? Don't they take money out of my pocket? That's your decision. But if you give it to a third party, because it's already in a free loan fund, you're able to what? To address many things simultaneously. Therefore, rather than you having to make a decision every time to lend or not to lend, put it in the fund, and therefore, 
there's no reason why the mitzvah cannot be performed continuously, even though you're not involved at the particular moment. What happens if the end of the sabbatical year comes and the borrower doesn't pay? The lender has no right to, to collect. So even though you lent the money to be paid before the sabbatical year is over, very often people tarry and they don't pay the loan on time. So you're taking a risk when you lend money. If the sabbatical year comes and it's over, you, you, forfeit, the, you forfeit that money. Person says, you know, I prefer, I'm not a risk taker. And there's always that risk. But it's interesting. when you make an investment, as secure as the investment is, there's always a risk. Always a risk. Except the profit is a lesser profit if the risk is a lesser risk. Lesser risk. Greater risk, well, you may lose all the money, but if you make, you can make much, much more. So the chances are more. So when it comes in your personal life, there's always an element of risk. Man takes, borrows money, gives you collateral. And it'll tell you who'll pay by a certain due date. But you never know. The collateral will go lost. And maybe he won't pay in time. Maybe he'll go over the due date. And maybe the can't, loan will be canceled. God says you still have to lend them. You can't worry about every, every detail. Because ultimately, whatever you have, you only have because God gives it to you. You have to act responsibly. Get a guarantor. Get collateral. Do everything. But there's always reason to say, but even everything said and done, I'm not really, I don't feel so comfortable. But God says he still has supposed to lend the man the money. It's a positive commandment. And if you withhold, you're a violation of negative commandment. That's how important this mitzvah is. So said, but there's a cost factor. So we'll ask you a question. When you buy matzah for the Seder, you know a pound of shmur matzah costs for the Seder? To $40 a pound. It's quite, quite expensive. You know, you don't buy shmur matzah, you save yourself $40. A loaf of bread doesn't cost that much. But the special matzah filled the mitzvah cost. Doing mitzvahs, there's a cost factor doing mitzvahs. Because it's essential to your being. A Jew's being is more than his physicality. The Jew's being is his spirituality. And despite the cost you do it, that only increases the reward and the value of the midst of the doing. Because when it comes to do the will of God, th there are no holdbacks. I'll even borrow to do his will. But ultimately, you can be compensated. Very often in this world, but definitely in the world to come, if you do the mitzvah. So to say, I don't want to lend because you never know, so that means there's a cost factor. Well, every mitzvah has a cost factor. But you're getting a good guarantor. You're taking collateral, but you never know. But you never know any anytime you never know. Despite that, God says you must do it. Rely on me. So if you rely on God, you have no problem. Yes, no. Probably getting back, even if you don't. I, I, I still I scored big. That even increases the value of the mitzvah. Although there's a chance, you may not get it back, you do it in either case. That shows shows God how dedicated you, to, to, you are to doing his will. You will.